Hello, everyone, and happy Wednesday. My name is Becky Calling uh, at Tech with Becky. Mm -hmm. I am from GEG SoCal. I'm also one of the global GEG leaders. And today I will be backstage with the wonderful Laura. And I'll let you introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Laura Stevens, and that was my kitten, Finley. Uh, we are here in just outside of St. Louis, Missouri. I am a STEM teacher, and it's at Steven STEM on, on Twitter, and I am one of the global GEG leaders as well. Awesome. And back to you, Becky. Cool, and so we are all actually here to see the man of the hour, Mr. Devin Rossiter from Bakersfield, California. He's also part of the uh, London 19 cohort for Google Innovator, and he's going to be sharing part of his Innovator project with us today. So, Devin, I'm going to hand the stage over to you, and we're going to go hide out backstage. Hey, thank you very much, Becky, Laura. I appreciate uh, all that you do to help put these uh, programs together. And uh, yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good uh, anywhere you are. I hope you're staying safe. I hope that uh, things are treating you well. And I hope that whatever challenges lie ahead with this upcoming school year, whether you're underway or not, uh, that you feel that you've got uh, enough tools and support to be able to take this in a direction that will benefit you and those that you serve. Uh, my name is Devin Rossiter. Uh, in addition to all of those things, I'm also an academic coach at Walter Stern Middle School here in Bakersfield, California. Um, I've been in education for about 10 years. Prior to my uh, current role, I also worked as an instructional specialist for Bakersfield City School District, focusing on math. It's a K-8 district. It's actually the largest K-8 district in the state of California, serving about 36,000 students. So I've had the chance to visit and observe in a lot of classrooms across our city. Uh, in addition, I also worked as a sixth grade teacher at uh, Voorhees Elementary School here in Bakersfield. And during that time, I explored a lot of that space and um, you know had a really unique room that I worked with. Um, it was an older campus, about 60 years old. It was part of the original campus when it opened up. Uh, countertop with uh, counter to ceiling windows on one side of the room. Uh, you know, great acoustics. It had a, just an old school wooden roof, which as you'll see, um, is very near and dear to me. And something I've always been fascinated about is the idea of a classroom. One of the experiences that always resonated with me is when I went to uh, my hometown of Staten Island, New York over a Thanksgiving break. And we took our family to the Richmond Town Preservation. So it is a preserved um, historical recreation of when the Dutch had originally moved to the New York City area in the 1690s. And one of the spaces they had set up is called the Vorlaser House. It is the oldest schoolroom in North America. It is in the basement of a uh, old uh, style home and it is set up with a lectern and four rows of benches. And it startled me because of how similar it was in its layout to some of the classrooms that I have observed here in 2010s and beyond. So I really wanna take this opportunity with you to kind of explore not just what our classrooms are going to be right now in the immediate future, but what they can be going forward and reevaluate them as learning spaces. So we're going to take a look at you know interior design as an informative in element as far as classroom layout. We're going to take a look at creating digital spaces that are engaging and inviting enough and welcoming to students so that they're familiar enough to navigate. And then we're going to take a look at shifting what exactly is a classroom and how to take advantage of spaces on your campus that may not otherwise be accessible to your instruction. So I hope you'll uh, join me for this hour. If you have any questions, our wonderful hosts in the background are going to be responding in the chat. So we'll bring some of those questions forward for you. This is going to be a ride. Um, if you have a, um, if you're watching this on a laptop, that's great. Um, there is no necessarily preferred device for you to join us today, uh, but I will say that those of you on more mobile devices will have a little bit of an advantage later on in the session. And I'll get to that shortly. Um, a little bit as we go on and as I begin, my career didn't start in education. Uh, I was one of those that came in from the outside because I didn't want to be an educator when I came out of college. What I wanted to be was a sports broadcaster. 
Um, I grew up in Staten Island listening to WFAN on the radio. So I followed very closely the everyday uh, ups and downs, mostly downs of the New York Mets, as well as the Rangers for the NHL. Um, the 94 Stanley Cup was a formative moment of my life because it was the moment where I decided I wanted to be there when the big moments happened. And so that's what I pursued. I went to Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, Boston is a wonderful town to learn this craft because you have so many opportunities available at your fingertips. So at Northeastern University, I served as the sports director for the student radio station, 104.9 FM WRBB. And as the sports director, I had the opportunity to provide play-by-play -play and color commentary for all of our Division I sports, baseball, football, basketball, and most significantly for my career, profession, um, hockey. So the home for hockey at Northeastern University is Matthews Arena. It is one of the most significant sporting venues in the world. It is, in fact, the oldest indoor ice rink, opened up in 1910. Uh, it was uh, accessible to sporting events two years before the Titanic sunk. So when I would come to this arena, this beautiful old barn, and you can see kind of the architecture where the steel support beams are supporting a wooden roof. Balconies, which didn't exist when the building opened, needed to be forced in. So you can have the front row of the student section of the band immediately over the glass so that anything they yout and shell at, op at opposing uh, goaltenders, no matter how obscene or hurtful, still comes through very vividly and clearly and resonates throughout this old, uh, beautifully acoustic building. Now, for hockey, the perch is everything. The viewpoint you use to call your game for an audience that can't see what's happening um, makes all the difference in the world because you want to be able to see plays developing on either side of the ice and be able to relay that to an audience that may be thousands of miles away. Our audience mainly catered to alumni and families of players that uh, lived in you know other time zones. My bird's eye view was right there. This was my office for about the five years where I was calling games for Northeastern University. It was a suspended catwalk accessible through a very steep diamond plated steel grating. Uh, we had a phone line, which we would use with our box. So we essentially had two headsets, a crowd mic that we would stick out to pick up natural sound and then a phone line. So when you listen to our games, you heard us calling the games over the phone. We did have some desk space in order to lay out some uh, stats, some uh, promos that we would need to read. It was very compressed. And we didn't really have that much space beyond the two of us, the myself and my broadcast partner, because this also needed to be used for the visiting radio announcers, for our commercial station, for the sports information team for Northeastern University, and any other visiting media. Uh, this space has been since upgraded and moved as part of a renovation down here, a little bit lower, but there's something about calling the game up high that is a very unique experience. Now, that served us well for student radio, for, for uh, college sports. One of the other benefits of studying sports broadcasting at Northeastern University is that you learn from the best. And my professor at Northeastern was Joe Castiglione, the play-by-play -play voice for the Boston Red Sox. He was behind the mic when the ball went through Buckler's, Buckner's legs in 86, and he was also behind the mic when the Red Sox broke the curse and won the World Series in 2004. He's been there ever since and still does Red Sox games um, from his perch at Fenway Park which luckily for me was only walking distance away from my campus. So I had the opportunity to work with Professor Castiglione quite a bit in the press box for WEEI Sports Radio at 850, uh, the top billing sports radio station in the United States. This is the broadcast booth at Fenway Park in 2018. Over here, you see Professor Castiglione, as well as his broadcast partners for this year, uh, Dave O'Brien and Sean McDonough. Now, even though the view is much better here at Fenway Park than it was at Matthews Arena, you could see some similarities relating to the function of their jobs. This is radio. However, 
the way that each individual approaches their job with this layout is evident in how the setup of this room is stationed. So you can see here, Professor Castiglione, even though he's got a good view of home plate, you still want to be able to paint the picture for your audience listening. And so if you can tell over here, there is a monitor with the television feed of the broadcast accessible to him. He also has all of his stats on a push pin board here on the side. Some are highlighted with more relevant stats that he may want to call out during some um, quiet time where there's really not a lot happening. Baseball's tough. For a three hour game, the ball's only in play about 12 or 13 minutes. So the rest of that time, you got to come up with something to say. But it's also a lean towards his preference in how he calls the game. So you can see he works with a headset microphone as well as um, his uh, stat sheets over here. You can see Dave O'Brien over here. He has a different approach with how he'll call this game. Yes, he's got uh, headphones on, but he works with a free, what we call a stick mic. That's right in front of him so he can get a little bit closer in on the game and step back. Um, when he would clear his throat or if he needed to breathe in, what he would do is lean back and then come back in when he's got enough air. That is his preferred approach. Sean McDonough has a headset and what he does instead is he uses a cough box. So this device over here is actually a mute button for your microphone. So if you need to cough, you turn around and you push that button down, then you cough and then release it so that your listener doesn't pick that up. You can also see how they use this space for quick reference points. Some of the more commonly read promos or ads that they may have at certain points in the game are, are taped up. It's very low tech, but it's effective and it doesn't need to be very visual because your viewers or your listeners, your audience, they're not, they're not going to see you. But for these individuals to do their job, this space is set up for them to be the most productive possible. Now, going beyond that, I had another office that I would occasionally work in beyond simply Fenway Park and Matthews Arena. This is the building I actually graduated in, and it was home to some of the most significant moments that I was able to get behind the microphone. It's the TD North Garden. It is the home to the Boston Bruins and the Celtics of the National uh, Hockey League, National Basketball Association. It's also home to the annual Beanpot Tournaments, where I would call um, games in a local tournament every year against Boston University, Harvard, Boston College. They've run this every year since the 50s. And um, fortunately for us, we've won the last three years running. Now, while I was there, that was not a reality. We hadn't won since the 80s. But in addition to being able to call those games in this building, I also got a lens on how the professional hockey broadcast for television works. So this is the press box at the TD Garden. The two gentlemen here have been calling the Bruins for about 10 years now. This is Jack Edwards, if you're familiar with them from previously ESPN fame, and Andy Brickley, who has been calling uh, Boston hockey for, for a long time now. You can see how their setup differentiates for television as well as for hockey. Now, if you remember my broadcast office at college, the uh, the broadcast booth was higher up, but not necessarily farther back. The same can be said for uh, just about any hockey setup. This is the 10th floor of this building. So they're 10 stories up above the action. They as well have the television feed, but they also have a backdrop for when they do a live stand up on camera. In addition to that, they have a deep control over what the viewer sees. It's not simply up to the director. They can use a, a, a really creative and unique setup to allow them to pull up information quickly and then relay that to their audience. So if you'll draw your attention right down here, you can see that Jack Edwards has in front of him a three touch screen setup, one for each of the team's players. You can see them highlighted by a player number, name highlighted very visibly, very big. So that if you want to bring up their player profile, all you have to do is touch right there and it shows up on screen during action. In addition to that, the main stat sheet is located over here. And if you can read what this says, these are things like first goal or leading or trailing at the end of the period or power play. So basically, if there is a stat that they want to bring up for a certain situation happening during the game, they can touch that and it appears on screen. It is a very efficient way that allows the announcers to tell their story of the game 
with more precise, uh, with, with more um, detail and uh, more visibility. So it allows them to craft that narrative more efficiently. Now, the reason I think of this when I start to talk about classrooms is what is the product of our classrooms? In sports broadcasting, it is the story that you tell. In learning, what is the product? It's what students come away with. It's what students make. And the idea of making knowledge, of building knowledge, was always really significant to me. I very rarely called my classroom a classroom. I didn't have classroom eight at Voorhees Elementary. We had studio eight. And the idea of our classroom being a studio was very significant because when you know you're going into a studio, you know you're going in to design, to play around, to explore, and ultimately leave with a product that shows what you've done in that space that you can share and take pride in. We have a really unique opportunity now. Many of us are away from our classrooms at this time. And so it gives us pause to consider that space. So I want to take a moment to ask you a question and feel free to jump in on our chat. I want to donate about two minutes to this brainstorm activity, no matter how you're viewing this. And here's my question to you. How would your dream or ideal classroom design differ from your current or most recent? And when I say most recent, I know that may, you know, that, that may be about six months back for some of us, but if you could put something in or change something in with your current space, that's different than what you have now, what would that be and why? Let's see what we come up with in the chat. By the way, I want to thank uh, Clay Smith um, for the extension, the slides timer that allows me to not only have a real time um, lens here, the specific time, but also countdowns built right into the slides without having to bring in a YouTube video for that. Great tool for engagement if you're going to be working with slides and remote instruction coming up. Those of you joining us on Facebook or on uh, YouTube, thank you. Individual support is always welcome. It's probably the most expensive thing. You know, when you look at any business or organization, the most expensive piece of overhead is personnel, right? Windows, lighting. Absolutely. Um, that's a big part of the environment of a lot of our classrooms right now. Um, yeah, a lot of the windows that we have access to are, are kind of out of reach, right? They're, you know, they're not handy. And as a result, they really don't let a lot in here. The shape, uh, the seating arrangements, I see a lot of common threads here. And I think we can relate to a lot of that. And I think we're getting to the point of the idea of, of function, right? What do we want a room to do for us? So here is a, a topic I want to discuss here. I know that it's been a hot topic in regards to certainly the conversation I've seen on Twitter just yesterday. And it's the trend of Bitmoji classrooms. Now here's what I'm going to say. Here's my, um, you know, my two cents on Bitmoji classrooms. A lot of the great classrooms that we're seeing look very elegant, they're designed, but if you've noticed, they generally tend to reflect the existing classrooms. And I just paused and I thought about this. If we have this opportunity to basically create an ideal version of a classroom, why would the ideal we create mimic and replicate what we already have that we identify as less than ideal? So. I started thinking about this, all these things that I would want to have in a classroom. Why wouldn't you put that in your virtual version? So I want to go ahead and just kind of share some things about, um, not necessarily Bitmoji classrooms, but virtual classrooms as far as the interface. We know that one of the key components of remote instruction is having a central hub, a starting place that's easy for students to navigate where they're going to go to take part in learning. 
I always thought it'd be so cool if I had a brighter kind of setting in my wall. You know, the idea of not necessarily simply just, you know, more windows, but the idea of like more brightly colored wallpaper, you know, um, the idea of having something more dynamic out of a display that students can interact with. Uh, the idea of not simply just learning intentions and success criteria, but you know, how about the idea of problem driven objectives? This idea of answering the question of why do I need to know this instead with here's why other people need to know this. Now you might use this tool for something else, but we're going to answer this question by understanding the tool that helps answer that question. Uh, I even just like the idea of creating that little personal touch to this thing. I'm never going to have a Banksy in my classrooms, but how cool would it be if I did? And just having this space just for personalization and rotating. Um, I, I love the idea of designing and creating the ideal environment because when I go back to my physical classroom, I'm going to take some of that in as far as something I would want to work towards as an ideal. Now, that's great. And I know that people have a love hate relationship with Bitmojis right now. I don't know if they've jumped the shark. Uh, a teacher out of Virginia uh, by the name of Esther Park had a great solution to that. Why don't you be the Bitmoji? So it's the idea of taking your virtual classroom background. And now you have that as like your green, uh, green screen space. Or if you're doing a Zoom, that becomes your background and now you're in front of it where you can more specifically guide your students to individual parts that you want to draw their attention to. Or if you're doing asynchronous learning, this becomes the starting point. Like you can guide people and say, guide your students and say like, okay, we're going to go over here to start things off. We're going to, then we're going to move to this part here. And I want you to feel welcome and open into this space here. Uh, I love that idea. But the whole point is to create a welcome environment. And sometimes welcome could simply be friendly. And so I saw this idea on Twitter the other day. Let's think about some of the more commonly used interfaces that students interact with. The one I can guarantee has picked up a lot of traction over the last six months with students is the Nintendo Switch. If your kids have not been playing Animal Crossing over the last six months, hopefully they find it at some point. But the idea of creating an interface doesn't necessarily mean it has to be a classroom. How great would it be if you, and by the way, I was able to design this last night in Google Slides, um, just a simple interface with the four or five most important things that you want your students to be able to interact with. I could see this being very helpful with the littles um, who don't need a lot that they have to navigate through. But just something as simple as this lets your kids know where they're going to be working and interacting with and what their resources are. So just play around with that. Um, you know, one of the things, by the way, I know that a lot of teachers are hesitant about using Google Slides as an interface because they're worried that they may be able to manipulate things with it. So I'll throw this out there too. If you want it to be just a full screen intro and you have like a link that they'll click to, to get to the thing. If you know of the copy trick, where if you go to the URL of your slide and the part where it says edit, you change that, you know, you can change that to copy and it'll force a copy for the individuals to make their own. So they're not all in the same one at the same time. Well, instead of copy, if you change that to preview, it brings them to a full screen version of your slide. And hopefully your virtual classroom is one slide only. It doesn't need to be a lot, but when they have this up, it's full screen. So they don't have all those other options in slides. It becomes a full screen interface for them. So uh, however you're going to be bringing students to that virtual space to launch off at that central hub, change that from edit to preview and they're in. And again, thanks to Clay Smith for the timer, built that in to the interface. I could probably move that over a little bit, but make it yours. Make it a comfortable interface that you know students will be able to interact with. Now, beyond that, I want to talk a little bit about the day when we can come back to our campuses. It's going to be very different. Hopefully, it's very different. And hopefully, you have an administration that is supportive enough to at least try to have safeguards in place for you. Now, in general years, there are some helpful tools to help out with classroom layout based on the tools that you may have handy. 
Um, there are a couple at uh, uh, classroom.forteachers.com. Uh, I'll share some of these as resources in the uh, links afterwards um, that you can access these slides. But what are the things that you'll be able to do with this slide deck that I've created and built for you is you'll be able to play around with ideas of layout before you return to your campus. So what you'll see here, and I'll see if I can kind of exit out of this deck here so we can play around with it a little bit better, is I've designed some interactives that you can move around. So if you know where your interactive display is, you can go ahead and just drag that up there. If you know where your door is going to be laid out, which way it's gonna swing open to, you can play around with that too. But you know, having that space to play around with ideas and know what's gonna work, where your teacher's desk is, if you have uh, an ank uh, a kidney table here that you can use for small group instruction, each of these squares on this grid represents one square foot. And that's really important to know because when you start looking at student seating, when we come back to campuses in line with CDC um, regulations, that's gonna be really important to have a deep understanding of. So when you move this over, the blue square is going to be the student desk surrounded by a circle with a six foot diameter. So you can start to see what classroom distancing will look like in different arrangements. And that's really important for a lot of reasons, because I think we have a very, um, you know, purposeful idea of what classroom seating looks like. And unfortunately, a lot of the preferred flexible seating ideas that we have, as well as collaborative seating arrangements that we've gotten accustomed to over the years, that's got to go out the window right now. That doesn't mean that we have to go back to rows and columns, but it does make us reconsider kind of the, the dynamics of where we start to lay out our rooms. Now, with that said, I want to go ahead. I'm going to go back into a uh, full screen here. And I think I kind of previewed it by clicking ahead one slide accidentally. But what I'm going to do on this next slide is we're going to do a little um, four pane activity. This isn't going to be a which one doesn't belong. This isn't where you get to say this space is the worst because or it's different because all of these things have something in common. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and show you four images and in the chat, go ahead and type in what you identify as a common thread in all four of these. And no, the answer is not all four of these are on my property. Yet. What do you notice is common about all four of these spaces? Let's see what you have in the chat. There may or may not be in a delay um, from when the question gets thrown out to when the answers come in on the chat. I'm gonna pop in really quick and tell you there's definitely a delay. So give it just a minute. So I'm going to have a staring contest with you, the audience. Oh, here we go. Okay. There's some really interesting answers coming in. Uh, looking at uh, Robin's responses. Yeah, most people are throwing in the idea of seating being very common. Um, and I see that Robin is throwing this in there. John Nash is throwing this here. Um, the idea of the direction of the seating is very interesting. And I'm glad that you drew attention to that because I would like to one of the key components of interior design as well as external when you're doing city planning with seating is the idea that wherever the seats are facing is the focus and the purpose of the room. So if you're in a living room here, you notice that all of the seating in this living room is pointed towards the television. Why? Because you're in there to watch, to relax and to just absorb information. Here at the Japanese steakhouse, all the seating is around the hibachi because you are there in order to observe the chef 
do his amazing work. And you know what I'm talking about, chopping up the onion, putting it into a train, and then he hits the little spatula on the grill and goes, choo, 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 and then lights it on fire and makes the volcano. And then he daps the little sesame seeds in their pepper and makes it like sparkly. You know the game. You've been there. Um, in this family room, this area, if you notice, all of the seating is facing all of the other seats because the purpose of this room is conversation to enjoy each other's company. And this tenet also holds true when you head outside because when you head out to this coastal area with the benches, you're there to enjoy the view. It's facing out into the ocean. Even when you go to a playground, if you notice the benches are seated so that they are facing the structure so that parents can have a place to relax and watch their kids play. It's a really important thing to bring up in education because if you think about most classrooms, when you do have seating arrangements that are non-collaborative, they generally face one thing. They are positioned to face the display. In the past, it would have been a chalkboard. Now it's interactive displays like a smart board or a projector screen. And if you think about what everything is facing, you then have to consider what else is being ignored with the rest of that classroom space. Yeah, I always think it's really interesting that the conversation about student work is that it's so important to have student work in the classroom. And yet when you walk around classrooms, where is that student work positioned? In the back where students never have a chance to look at it. And the reason being, well, we only have, for the most part, four walls in our classroom. I can only prioritize one. And I would challenge that idea. One of the things I took great pride in in my classroom at Voorhees Elementary School was the fact that we disrupted that idea of one front wall. When really all you have to do is change the orientation of your space by about 45 degrees, and suddenly you have two front walls. Now this is gonna require getting rid of your teacher desk. I would recommend doing that anyway, um, because that space can be so much better suited for what um, your students will use that space for. Space is a premium in a classroom. I can tell you that my preferred seating arrangement when I was teaching was taking all the desks and lining them against the perimeter of the room facing the wall. And that sounds terrible to make these kids have to face a wall for six hours of the day. And they weren't. They were facing the wall maybe one hour a day when they would do independent work. And they would do that because the rest of the time, now I have open on the center here. This was wide open space. Students were allowed to bring chairs to sit if they wanted to, or they could sit on the floor when we did group discussion, small group instruction, collaboration. I taught sixth graders, 11, 12 year olds, they loved seating on the floor. And when I asked them, their response was, because it reminds me of being in kindergarten. And I thought that was funny. I said, oh, why is that fun? And I said, because it was the last time I really enjoyed learning. That brought, that hit me hard, that hit me hard. So I wanted to bring that atmosphere back, but also having that space in the center to freely move around and group however you want, stretch out. It was a very, it was the most flexible seating I could come up with. It also made grouping very easy. Now, we're not gonna be able to do that when we return to campuses. So what could this look like when we have to bring in distancing guidelines? It might end up looking like this. Maybe 14 or 15 desks in this space. Now, just because you need to have six feet of distance between students doesn't mean that you have to have a whole circle's radius of six feet around each desk. You can do a half circle right against the back wall. You can do a, a quarter circle in the corner if absolutely necessary. It's so critical that you have that. But if you notice here, all of these desks are facing that corner podium. So I have two front walls. I have one that's more dynamic with my digital display. I have one that is dry erase that I can interact with that's more static in case there is key details or anchor charts that I want to refer to. But I have, in essence, doubled the amount of front focus space in my room just by changing the orientation of the room by 45 degrees. 
Now, are there other things you can do to make these spaces more accessible to students? One of the drawbacks of having a single front wall is it's dominated by a single front display that may not be accessible to many students. So one of the things where this ended up creating issues was when it came to anchor charts. And we love anchor charts. We know that there's a lot of research behind them. The challenge is when we run out of space for anchor charts because we have so many great ones that are relevant to the learning. So one of the ideas I would posit to you, um, one of the things I would recommend is a dynamic anchor chart. And what I mean by that is, let's see if you can take a monitor that you don't use anymore. And since a lot of our rooms are moving to all-in-ones and, and Chromebooks, it shouldn't be too challenging to find a spare monitor around or even an older television flat screen that you can attach an HDMI cord to, to a Chromebook or another device. Run and design a Google slide where each slide is an anchor chart and then set it on present so that it rotates automatically. You can use publish to web to do that so it auto advances every few seconds or so. So think about how much space on a wall six or seven anchor charts would take up, digitize them and put them on a rotating basis. Because we all know that our students, when they kind of zone out, they have that one space in the classroom where they just stare off into. Well, how great would it be if the thing that they stared off into rotated off relevant key information every few seconds or so, so that the most important things you know was resonating with them. So that's something I think is really important uh, as far as just reconsidering the space. In addition to kind of getting away from interactive displays, let's think about how interactive they really are. If teachers are the ones interacting with them the most, I would argue they're not really interactive for students. In fact, because of how large they are and how static they are, they're probably not that accessible for students to actually see if they are toward the sides or in the back of the room. So I love the idea that we are shifting away from interactive displays as a means of access to instead mirrored monitors positioned throughout the room. So for example, if you're in a science lab and you have a camera for dissection or experiments, that's generally a very narrow space and it's very difficult for anybody in the rear of the room or to the sides to be able to see what's going on. Even if you have a document camera with a big um, display, but if you have smaller displays along the perimeter of the room and they're not as expensive as they used to be. In fact, six or eight of these is probably still less expensive than one massive 70 or 80 inch display in the front of the room. And if you think about it, it's a lot easier to maintain than it would be um, like a smart board or an interactive display. You don't have to update the monitors. You are not dependent on losing the accessories because let's be honest, with that smart board, if you lose the markers or if you um, can't find the eraser, your, its functionality is, is diminished significantly, especially with the older smart boards where it's just a projector. If you have a substitute come in one day and decides to write on it with a Sharpie, who good luck with that. Meanwhile, you can have multiple monitors set up they're all controllable and accessible through one device. If you want to shut them off, you can go ahead and grab a universal remote and you can find them anywhere. They're cheap and you have control over the entire room. And no matter where you are in the room, you can see exactly what the focus of the discussion or the conversation is. So the front of the room doesn't have to be the front for everybody. Now, I think that one of the important things to keep in mind too, when we discuss classroom layout, is one of the final drawbacks of a lot of classrooms that we see. And it's along these lines here. This is a classroom on our campus uh, back in 2019 and stunningly, but you know, not surprisingly, it was very emblematic of some of the challenges we ran into in, as a district in regards to smart boards or front of the room projectors. And if you were in a classroom that had that overhead projector when you were a child, this cuts you to the core too, because it's very familiar. One of the problems with those projector based front displays, which are still fairly prominent in a lot of classrooms is that those bulbs burn out. They are not infinite. They don't have a long shelf life. And for a lot of campuses, those are very expensive to replace at least the perception is. I think generally they're about $75 or $80, but 
we know how schools operate when we try to put in a request for those replacements. It can take some time. So what do teachers do when they can't get a replacement and the bulb starts to dim? That's when you start to see the lights come off. That's when you start to see windows paper over, curtains shut, doors slammed. It becomes a very bleak and depressing environment where students are going to be spending the majority of their day. And for a lot of students that come from socioeconomically disadvantaged homes, the lighting is not much better at home. So these are the environments students find themselves in for most of their time. And we know the impact that that has on mental health and emotional well-being. It impedes learning because you are just caught in this very dim glow. And not only that, it impacts student sleep cycles as well. So when I applied for the Google Innovator program, my challenge was this. How might we encourage learning environments that are less dependent on front displays and more amenable to healthier lighting? And just unmute here. Um, I think we should be okay. You bring up a great point, Rick, is that when you ask students, hey, can we leave the lights on and what do you want to do here? Um, many students will tell you that they absolutely must have, they will prefer the lights off. And the reason they do that is because they are naturally inclined to sleep in these environments. It's not ideal. It's not beneficial. So I wanted to see if I could explore how might we encourage learning environments that are less dependent on front displays and more amenable to healthier lighting. Well, that got me into the Google Innovator program, and I'm glad it did because it gave me a chance to meet up with this gentleman here, Ben Rouse, who was my coach through the, um, actually, you, you know, it was interesting that you could actually find him through Google Arts and Culture when you do that face comparison. Uh, what do you look like compared to art? And so I thought that was really helpful, but he did a great job of kind of framing my challenge for me. So when we got to London, he was able to look at my challenge and say, you know what? Okay, that's great. You want to bring better lighting conditions to students. Well, what's the best lighting conditions that you have on your campus right now? And, you know, I'm a smart ass from New York. I, I got a, a quick, clever answer for everything. And I go, I don't know, uh, the sun. <laughs> well, here's the thing with that. That was the correct answer. So I realized that we needed to make sure our students had better access to sunlight. And it changed my challenge. It went from that to this, how might we shift learning environments towards better lit existing spaces on campus? I'm gonna go ahead and restart my camera right now. If you have a laptop or a mobile device that you're viewing this presentation on, I want you to try to take this outside and think about how differently you're able to view this content and how differently you feel when interacting with the learning through this forum. That was something that I was very curious about because many of us have access to the great outdoors, but we feel limited by our classrooms because we have so many of our resources digitized. It's a slide, it's a classroom. And so there are a lot of challenges with that, especially if our students are trying to access content through things like Chromebooks. They're not that visible. The screens are not very clear when you have to compete with natural lighting. So that changed what my challenge was, and it made me think about solutions that would allow us to make outdoor learning more accessible. And so with that, I want to introduce to you my Google for Education Innovator Project. This is the outsider. It occurred to me that we had to make it easier for teachers to be able to bring learning outside. And so over the course of a year, I designed the outsider device to do just that. Lightweight, I used mostly PVC pipes. Visible, I built out uh, solar shading using outdoor furniture fabric that fits the device. The width fits within the parameters of many of our classroom doors. The tires, are all terrain so that you can navigate them on just about any terrain that you have on your campus because we all have floors. We also have that door threshold. So these are pneumatic tires 
that are durable. The device itself also holds about 200 pounds, so it's easy to be able to just pick up and go. So wherever you're going on campus, bring it with you. This is going to be instrumental, I feel, because we want to give our students as much space as possible when going outside. Now, what does that look like? Let's say each of these cones represents a student. I want you to think about what this would be within a physical classroom space. Six feet apart. Surprisingly, a lot less claustrophobic. Arranging them so that that diameter is still met. And one of the beautiful things about the outsider is that even from back here, the screen is visible because that black material, that solar fabric, is blocking out the sunlight surrounding me. So I can still see everybody where you are. And if I'm back there, I can still see what's going on. Now, I wanted to kind of focus on the simplicity of the design. I didn't want to overcomplicate things. I didn't want to throw in a lot of hardware that you could or could not connect to. So that's why I didn't build in things like a Bluetooth speaker. Um, but there are ways that you can make the audio more accessible by connecting your own. What's key is that you have the power to bring your learning anywhere on your campus. And there are some tremendous benefits, by the way, when it comes to uh, learning outside. Let's see if I could bring this back up here. When we talk about the benefits of outdoor learning, there's quite a few. Most surprisingly is that when you start a lesson inside and then go outside to continue that lesson and then return back inside to summarize it, student performance increases and greater learning retention occurs. This all comes from um, a great paper done at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point that you can follow on the slide deck uh, afterwards. There's also tremendous beneficial um, health uh, reasons for students to learn outside. And by the way, just to clarify, outdoor learning doesn't mean you're learning about the outdoors. You don't have to do a lesson outside and it has to be about the trees on your campus or cloud patterns. It can be about anything. You don't have to design and plan out an outdoor lesson to do outdoor learning. Because the, you know, and beyond simply just having more access to natural light, it changes up the learning space. Students do get more physical activity because they're more comfortable with out, uh, outside learning. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of younger um, grade levels in Europe prioritize outdoor learning uh, in fact, I understand that in Germany in particular, the reason that most kindergarten spaces have a hybrid is because they want students to be able to understand their world and their surroundings. So it's stronger for childhood development, especially early. Students get excited whenever something happens that's different from the norm. Think about how thrilling it was when your teachers brought in that cart with the TV and the VCR, you said, oh, we are changing it up today. When you go outdoors for learning, you have greater student buy-in because students are more excited about what's to come. And by the way, students have a deeper sense of um, a civic pride and attitude in their campus and their community because the relevance of their learning is beyond those four walls. How often do we see it where students seem to get the content okay in the classroom, but then fail to apply it outside of it because they tie in the knowledge with the spatial surroundings. But if your surrounding is the entire world, then you don't have to learn everything for every spot. You can learn anything for any spot. And by the way, when you learn outside, families and the community have a deeper sense of the learning that's taking place because they see it. The product is right there in front of them. So there are so many benefits of outdoor learning beyond simply the safety considerations. It's just a great way to change up what we understand about a classroom, when in reality, a classroom doesn't exist anymore. 
It's a learning space. It's a studio. It's whatever you make of it. If you want to make sure you have a copy of our slides today with the resources such as the design studio, um, please make sure that you download it, make a copy for yourself at bit.ly, G-E-G -E Audacity. Um, you can also learn more about The Outsider at OutsiderEducation.com. Please follow me at Devin Rossiter on Twitter. Visit my website. You can check out the slide deck, uh, this entire presentation there at Devin Rossiter. And if you want to learn more about outdoor learning, uh, follow us on Twitter at OutsiderEDU as well. Hey, I want to thank Global GEG for the forum, for the opportunity to present today. This is the most unique opportunity that we've ever had in education to change the game. When we go back, what do you want to go back to? The nice thing about now is that we can try anything. The world's in our hands. And whatever you choose, I hope that this provides a little bit more insight into what we can make of the future.